worked with Dr. Romano for several years uh, on this research. Um, after Frank's passing in August, um, Jamil came uh, to me and uh, we worked with Dr. Carter and Dr. Klein also on his committee in order for him to finish up his thesis and make a great success of an awful lot of picking and sorting and boat work that he had done in the past. So without further ado, I will let Jamil tell you what he's been working on and um, hopefully we'll all learn something new. Uh, um, basically, um, Dr. Romano started in 2007 a um, a mile final survey of the northern Gulf of Mexico just in order to find out what was there and what um, what was going on basically as far as it, as far as in the benthic part of the Gulf and then um, the oil spill happened I think it was in 2010 or 2009 I don't remember the, the exact year but um, we got some funding to do some more work so we got to go on the boat some more and um, do a lot of research um, put the presentation together and present it some really cool places. Um, we did some. We did a talk in um, North Carolina, Mobile, um, one in Belgium. The Dr. Mine was supposed to actually go to himself, but he got sick again, so he couldn't go to Belgium. So Dr. Landers, who was our partner with this project from Troy, gave it. So it was pretty cool. But this is my, my is our half or our part was all the all the data was put together from from Troy and from Gospel State, and this is a chunk of it from 2007 to 2010. And it's entitled the Monofauna Community Structure of the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And it's by me. Okay. Uh, a little brief introduction. Um, for those who do and do not know what monofauna are, they're very small animals. They're non taxonomic. Um, they fit to a. They're typically smaller than a, than a millimeter um, in, in adult size, but they should be retained in a 42 micron sieve. So they're really, really small. Um, they occur pretty much everywhere um, that there is. Earth. Um, they're on land, they're in the oceans, they're in freshwater, they're in streams, they're in ponds, they're in lakes, they're on moss, they're on trees, they're on leaf litter, they're on pretty much probably on, on us, probably. Um, there's, um, I was told a, um, I wouldn't necessarily a joke, but it was like a, a, a saying or whatever that it, like there's so many, like for example, nematodes are so, are so plentiful on Earth that if you were to take, like step away from Earth, I guess, and like look at Earth and then take away the Earth. You would never know the Earth was gone because it's so covered in nematodes. Like you would never know that the world was not there because it's that there's that much nematodes on the planet. There's something like eighty thousand species, and there's roughly, and there's like they say that there's maybe like thousands more to be discovered. Like that they're like in the, in the deep parts of the world, and just that, that places that we haven't looked yet. So um, some of the phyla that um, that that are included uh, that are in the in the, the monofauna category. You guys said you got nematodes, you got tardigrades, which is what Dr. Mona worked on. There's little water bears that you probably saw in. Um, freshman lab that they were like, you know, swimming around like little cute little bears. And um, it's also a really neat, um, it's not really neat, but um, there's a model at the uh, Anderson Museum of a tardigrade. They're almost there. It's a giant blown up. There's, I don't know what it's made of. It's like a bit, it's made out of jelly, but there's a model of them at the Anderson Museum if you've ever been there. Um, yeah, kind of rates or so for upgrade balloons. There are also phyla that are, that, that are monofauna in nature that are. Actual fauna, uh, actual fauna, excuse me. Um, I, I already went over the day that they're terrestrial and they're aquatic. Um, most of them serve as food sources for our higher levels. Um, you got like shellfish, fish, some of that, like especially juvenile fish, feed on mild fauna. And they also um, they burrow in the soil and they move around and stuff like that. So they keep the um, the bacterial uh, content of the, of the soil circulated, so it keeps it keeps a lot of like microbiota going. Through, through their feeding and through their burrowing, burrowing, which they also eat, like they eat microbial stuff, and um, sometimes they feed on each other, they feed on uh, detritus, so it's like organic material. So they keep, like, they're very active as far as like the mythic level of the, of, of the of water, like whether it be sorts of streams, oceans, ponds, freshwater, or a marine. Um, some of them are used to, um, Measure effects of like, uh, of like environmental disturbances. You got like, um, you have like paper plants and stuff like that that, that run off into streams that are, are going to affect the uh, the population. So whether it be fish or invertebrates, you got oil spills such as the one in Gulf of Mexico. Um, you got habitat um, ha habitat loss, um, 
did, just anything where there's like a natural disturbance, my body can typically be used as far as like a, to not really look deep into like a habitat and see what's going on. Um, Cocoa pods particularly are a good organism. They're very sensitive to change, so they're always good. Um, and also the nematode, so the nematode's not too, too sensitive to stuff. They do use like the nematode cup of pie ratio to actually see what's going on because like nematodes might not be affected where cup pods might be affected. So you, you can kind of see what's going on there by looking at the cup pod and nematode ratio. Um, this, this project, like I said, was done by Dr. Romano and, and um, Dr. Stephen Landers at Troy. They, they got together and got this set up uh, with Noah. We had some help by um, one of Dr. Romano's former students, um, Dr. Uh, Walt Ingram. He's, he, he works at NOAA, he works in Pasigula, and uh, he helped get us on board there and got a ship time and all that good gravy. And if anyone has ever volunteered on a, on a NOAA cruise before, you know that you have to work 12 hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off, and if you get the night shift, it's not a lot of fun. So if you have not volunteered on a NOAA cruise, I don't recommend it, unless you just love fish and staying up all night. Um, the survey covers, we started right off the, the coast of Texas, the east coast of Texas, I guess it's only on the coast of Texas, it's the east coast of Texas, and went all the way down to the, to the Florida Keys. So it, it covered a pretty big space, it was, it was all north, it wasn't very, very south, it was just across the top, the slope of the shelf. Um, my all final studies, such as the one we're doing, have been pretty much done a lot of places. Um, I've seen some from North Carolina, the Arctic Ocean, Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, Indian Ocean. Um, there's some marshes. Uh, there's some that were done in marshes in Louisiana, um, the Mediterranean Sea, stuff like that. Um, most of them focus on how does depth affect mile fauna and how and how does food availability like like is there enough food for the mile fauna or, or, or how does having food or not having food affect the abundance of mile fauna. So ours is like, most of the ones that I, I, I had found, some of them were multi-year, but most of them were just like single, single year. They would, they would do it at a specific, specific time. Like there's a, um, Jeff Bagley said, he's, he's a, um, he was a student at Texas A&M. I, I believe he's a, he's a professor at the University of Nevada in Reno now, but he, um, his 06 study that I have cited here and I, I got a lot of information from, he did it just in like one month where he just took like, he took 51 stations and just made a study based upon that, it wasn't a multi-year thing, it was just a one-time sampling survey. Um, this study, we, went, we wanted to ask a couple questions and find out what was going on, so we said, we were like, well, do abundances vary by location, east, west, central, what's going on there, is, it, is this a determining factor, what's going on, it may or may not be. Um, also, do the type of myofauna, or and the, also the abundances, are they do they vary by depth? Because in previous studies, and just by just general thinking, you think well, if depth increases, your population is going to decrease. Just by just general thinking, because you have oxygen that gets lower, yet food availabilities get lower. Like the, the, the deeper that you go in a body of water, um, and also do they um, <coughs> are, are they affected by like the physical parameters, like I said, east, west, north, south, and environmental conditions like dissolved oxygen, salinity, sediment characteristics, and temperature, temperature as well. You'd think the temperature would, would play a, a, big, a big part in the events. Um, especially if you, have, if you have like some data before something bad happens and then you have data after something bad happens. Or like I said, we just happen to be Sampling in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, and then the oil spill happened. So we, we have data before the oil spill happened, the same year that the oil spill happened, and we have some data after the oil spill happened. So I just dropped my uh, drink. Um, so we, you can take that data and you can compare, you can compare pre and post disturbance data and say, you, you know, hey, well, did, did this disturbance have an effect or did it not have an effect? Because it could go either way. Um, also, if there is a disturbance, like I said, maize mile fauna serve as a major food source, so if air populations go down, well then things that feed on them may also go down. So you got like shrimp and fish and like that, and, and if they start like dying off or something, something like that, that something bad happens, within the process is going to go up and, and supplies are going to go down and just all kinds of really bad things are going to happen, so it's going to cause a lot of problems. Okay, on to how we did this. 
Um, sites were randomly chosen um, all across the north. We had a total of 151 sites, if I'm not mistaken, um, from all all four years. We were we were on some NOAA cruises again. Don't ever do that. It's not fun. Um, they chose the sites. Basically, they just chose random sites. We stopped when we helped them with their fish stuff. We also took our we took our grab samples at the same time that that they were doing they were doing the fish samples. So we go get our stuff and then we go help them. Um, we had a ship bait grab sampler. It's basically a mechanism. I probably should have included a picture, but it's spring loaded. It's got this. It's like this thing that's attached to this chain, and you have a bucket underneath, and it's and you, and you turn it, and it's spring loaded. So when, so when it hits the when it hits when it hits the uh, ocean floor, the springs pop in it, and this and it it, turn, it makes the uh, the little bucket that has this, you know this little scoop, and it goes and does this, does this little number, and it scoops up from the bottom, the top part of the um, ocean floor. So it's pretty cool. Um, from that big sample, it's about three three thousand milliliters. Um, that's a volumetric sample. We took we took a PVC pipe, five by five, PVC pipe, <clears throat> stuck it in the mud, capped it, brought it up, put it into a sample bottle, added some formalin to it. It was it was ten percent formalin, so so we we could preserve the monoponin. We took three of these. Those three samples were combined as a was one sample at each station. So we had three samples from each station. We took we counted each bottle and added that together for one sample. And we took a fourth sample for, for, for granulometry analysis. Um, we didn't start that in 2008. That was a new idea, I guess, that, that we just, that Dr. Ramona decided to add starting in 2008. So 2007, we don't have, actually have any granul, granulometry data. Um, like I said, we sent this thing off the side of the boat, took our, took our subsamples. Um, we preserved them for a little while, typically about 24 hours. Then we, um, we, would, we, would, we would, then in our free time, in our free time, we were not taking samples, or counting fish or cutting them open. We would take our samples, each sample, and we would sieve it in a, in a big sieve and a smaller sieve in order to, to, to actually retain the myofauna. And then we would, we would, we would have the the, the, small, the smaller sieve, the two to three micron sieve, and we would spray it all the myofauna and stuff into a little falcon tube, put the blue locks in there. And centrifuge it so ludox helps separate the myofauna from the actual sediment. Because some of the some, some of these creatures, they live, they attach to sand particles and they attach to the actual particles of the ocean floor. So in order to, to actually make sure we got those, we had to centrifuge them, and then, and then all the all the sediment would sink to the bottom of the bucket tube, and you'd have blue dogs and a bunch of animals in the top. So we would pour off the top part, put it back into the sieve, and the sediment we wouldn't use anymore, and then we would have to wash off the ludox um, in the sieve. So we would wa we, we would wash it pretty well because if you don't get the ludox off and you mix it with ethanol, with ethanol it jellies. It looks like raspberry jam and it's unusable because you can't see crap. Um, okay. Okay, the same off on we're washing to a sample bottle and then we preserved them with 70% ethanol. Like I said, and that's after the ludox was taken out. And then we took these things back home with us and we counted them, each sample bottle. So you, let's say you have station one, you got sample one, two, and three. You count each individual sample bottle. Record how much you found, and then we would just add, add those individual numbers together from each from each individual bottle. And we have one representative sample from each station. Um, we, we identified nematodes, copepods, tardigrades, polychaetes, orsifera, mites, catarrhines, and pericates as well. And we also found like uh, we found foraminifera and radiolaria, but they're not actual myofauna. So we counted them because they're important because there's so much of them, but we didn't actually count them in the actual counts because they're not myofauna. They're uh, amoeboid protist. Um, um, in order to get our data, like I said, our temperature, depth, salinity, such and such, we um, the uh, the NOAA people had a CTD. It's uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. But because it measures the, um, the temperature and the, and the conductivity are measured in the water column, that's not really useful to us. We want to know what the conductivity was in the actual sample and the temperature in the sample. So we only the only thing we used from that was the actual depth. So we got the depth data from them. And then the temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. Like as soon as we got this, this bulk sample off the, um, like, we, they brought it up, we detached it, and we put it in our bucket, and we, we took it back to the room where we, sorted our sample, where we started taking our samples. So the first thing, we did, first thing Dr. Nichols would do, he would, do, he, would he has this little computer fancy looking thing, and he sticks a little probe in there and takes all these little readings, and we recorded the uh, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and salinity from this probe. And some granulometric 
I've said that like a thousand times, it just kind of just rolls up the tone. It should anyway. Um, we would do this, do this here at Jacksonville. We would take the sediment, we would take, like we wouldn't just split it into clay and sand. So we took the sample, we, we would take like a bunch of sample and we would we put it in a soil dish and we would dry it in, 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 a, uh, in a drying oven for about two days because it's about how long it took to actually remove all the, all the moisture. And if that, we would take 15 grams of completely dry, completely dry sample. So that's, that's what we use for every gran, granul, granulometric analysis sample. We would take 15 grams of actual dry soil and we would add about 25 milliliters roughly of hydrogen peroxide, it was 6%. And it was called the hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide. I put, should, should have put peroxide right here. Uh, I did not. Hydrogen peroxide digestion method. Um, it was added, it was up 24 hours. Um, it would fizz and it would bubble because it was, it was eating away at the um, organic, ma organic material. The peroxide, it was pretty strong because the peroxide you use for like at home to clean your wounds out, to wash your mouth out, or whatever you use peroxide for, is about 3% that you buy from Walmart. This was 6%. And this doesn't seem like it's a lot, it's, big, it's, not, it's not that big of a difference, but if you get this up on your skin, you better get it off, it's gonna burn. Um, if, if more if more time was needed, or if it was if it was still like frothing, because this stuff, I mean, you, you have 15 grams of, of, of soil in a, in a beaker, and you add the, you add the peroxide, it just bubbles up like so much, because it's just it's, it's eating away at the organic material and everything else. We, if we needed more, we would add that a little bit more, and then we would put it um, in a water bath. We would heat the water bath up, and then we would put add a little bit more peroxide, and then we would put it into the water bath. The, the heat sped the rate of reaction. And after this happened. Um, we wanted to remove the peroxide, so we would we would we would suction, we would put the, uh, the the soil that the soil that was soaking the peroxide. We would put it into a um, into a suction. We, we, we had a suction with a little um, little papers, and we would wash it all out, and then we would wash it pretty thoroughly in the in, in the suction um, flask in order to get up, get the peroxide out. After that, we would take that and put it back into a clean beaker. We would add 10 milliliters of sodium sodium, sodium, sodium hexametaphosphate. Which was used to uh, separate separate the sand of the sand of the sand of the clay, and so it would be, it would be a solution. We would add we'd have about 25 milliliters of water and 10, 10 milliliters of 10 percent sodium hexametaphosphate, and we let that sit for about And then after that, after about 24 hours, we would sieve it we would, in, in a 42 micron sieve. The liquid and the and the and the, and the particles that passed through that were caught in the little the little metal pan underneath it. That was the clay because it was smaller. It was, it was smaller. It was smaller than three microns. So it would, go, it would go through. We would capture that all that liquid. We have a bunch of liquid with like it's all clay colored. It's like all, it's all dirty looking. We would take that. We would suction. We would suction that, and we would take what we, the water would go through. We would have the clay left on top of. We would take that and we would dry that, and that was the clay part. The soaked clay part, and then the part that was, that was actually still in the sieve that didn't go through that was sand. So we took that and we dried it as well. So. We, we put the clay into the petri dish, and we put the sand into the petri dish, and we dry them, and we have sand, we have the sand fraction, we have the clay fraction. And then the sand part was further um, processed. We would, we, would, we would process it into like coarser sand, um, granule sand, cor um, fine sand, very fine sand, and then if any clay was still left on top, I, we would just add the, um, if any clay had not passed through the sieve, we would just add it to the, um, to the clay sample after we were done. This is, a map, kind of, of where we sampled at. This is Louisiana, Texas, and Florida. It keeps on going all the way down to the Florida Keys. This is gonna give you an idea of where we sampled across. It was all very, very, very northern. Um, red is 07. I'm colorblind. I think that that's yellow or green. Not sure what color that is or that color. But if you can tell the colors, you can tell where we sampled at and about, and about where the depths were of where we sampled at. I'm just really bad with colors. But it's going to give us an idea of where we sampled from 2007 to 2010. And Dr. Morgan is looking into adding the, he's trying to find the original map on his computer. He wants to add the, um, the, the longitude lines and latitude lines of this. But I'm not sure if he's, if he's going to be able to find it. He told me he'd let me know. And that was like 20 minutes ago. Um, some results. Um, We found a bunch of animals um, to, from 2007 to 2010. Um, these numbers are not the actual raw numbers. We, we took the raw numbers and we standardized them into individual per meters cubed. So we took basically the, we'd, we'd take the three samples, we'd add them together, we have 
a raw number of what how, how much was in the sample, and we divided that by 0 0.003 in order to get numbers per meters cubed. So we have really small numbers, and we have really big numbers. In 09, there was about five million. In, in, in 2007 or 8, we had 43 million, roughly. But that's like again, that's a standardized number. So that's not actually how many we counted. If I counted that many, I probably would have killed myself. Um, tax it per year. Um, again, per, per meters cubed, you can kind of get a generalized idea of how much we found and what was there as far as how much of it was there. Uh, nematodes outnumbered everything by a long shot. There was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of nematodes. Um, Public pots were, were, were roughly second, um, still way far behind nematodes. And you got polychaetes were, the, were about number three, and then all the other smaller phyla. We found a few here and there. We found we found some pre maybe a lot in one year, or maybe a few were in, in a year, or then we find some tardigrades here and there, a little zipper here and there. But as far as like what we counted most of, it was definitely hematose, couple pods, and polychaetes. Okay, nematodes, um, numerically, again, the largest taxa that we found. Uh, they comprise anywhere from 84 to 89% of the entire populations from each year. So like they were by far again like the dominant organism. Copepods, six and a half percent, ten percent on a on a good year. Polychaetes, again, not more than four four and a half percent of a any given year. Minor taxa, again, that's uh, a definition of minor taxa would be something that we didn't find a lot of. That would be the Lorisifera and the, the tardigrades and the preapolids and stuff like that. The uh, the major taxa, which is what I refer to them as are our nematodes, cobalt, and polychaetes, because that's, that's what we found the most of. And to get that they, they comprised on on most years 99 to 99 and a half percent of the entire collection. So those three were the three biggest, um, as far as three largest abundances that, that we found in the Gulf. Um, some 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 um, environmental things that we found depths um, were very shallow to. Not quite as shallow, um, some were 26. The, our deepest one was 509. We only got one station that was above 500 meters, and that was 509 meters, which sounds kind of deep, but it's really not when you look at the rest of the Gulf of Mexico. Latitudes were 26 to 30 degrees. Our longitude was from, from, 90, from negative 97, because we're in the Western Hemisphere. It's a negative number. It's um, all right close to Texas, all the way to close to the Florida Keys, which is negative 93 degrees. Um, Salinity was pretty constant uh, across the Gulf. It ranged between 36 to 38 milliliters per liter. Um, it would decrease as depth increased, which could, which could be expected. The same thing with, with soft oxygen, it also decreased as uh, depth decreased. And it, was, it, had, it was between three and six milligrams per liter. So those were always pretty constant. Um, depth was not, a, was not a big player as far as like determining mild fine abundance like you would think that it would be. Um, most 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 places, most stations throughout all the years, they say pretty much the same. You didn't see a drastic decrease. You didn't see an increase. You didn't see anything. Depth just didn't really. There was no. There was no effect. Um, location, however, may play a part, especially with it, especially with the uh, with individual taxa, and especially with the with, with the minor taxa, because nematodes and polychaetes were found pretty much everywhere. Uh, in, the Western, in the Western samples, um, the major taxa, which again is the polychaetes and the nematodes and the copepods, found not 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 a lot of minor taxa, not a lot of um, tardigrades, not a lot of lorisifera. Uh, there was any times where we didn't even find lorisifera. In 09, I believe we didn't find not a single one. So they're apparently pretty pretty minor. Um, central samples, we didn't take quite as many central samples. I think we had 22 compared to the Western samples, which was 42. But still, even there, even there, we found. Again, the major, the major tax of, and almost not a lot of, of minor phyla were found, were found in the central stations. And we, we had the station, we had the sections marked off. Negative 97, negative 92 is western. Negative 92 to negative 87, which is the central stations. And then the east, negative 87 to negative 83. Um, these were more active, you'd say, as far as as far as myofauna abundance. Um, there's also more stations, but still. When you break it down, there was still more more per eastern station than there was anywhere else. Um, again, major taxa. Again, pr pretty weak with this. They were everywhere. They were eating. They were in the west. They were in the central. They were in the east. Um, a couple pods of polychaetes were a little higher in the east, 
not by a lot, but still nematodes were, were still found more there than, there, were, there, there was more nematodes than anything else. But there was, like I said, a slight rise in Copacolic and Polychaetes. And most of our smaller phyla, the minor phyla were found here. We found four receptor here. I think we found three in all four years. We found one each year except for 09, but we didn't find any. And I believe that they were all found in the east. Our targets were found here mostly. Um, stuff like that. The, the, the minor phyla was mostly found here in the east, in the eastern section. That, of course, when it increased, it had an effect on the top dissolved, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and temperature. The temperature went down, salinity went down, dissolved oxygen went down. But again, like I said, the depth did not have an actual effect on the amount of fauna abundance. And also, the abundances were not like when I compared them, compared the abundances to dissolved oxygen and salinity or temperature, which were affected by depth, the actual myofon abundances were not affected by depth. I mean, were not affected by dissolved oxygen and salinity or temperature. They were pretty much the same. They were pretty much constant. So neither temperature nor dissolved oxygen and salinity or depth were really factors in uh, myofon abundance. Um, this is a, a, gra a graph of temperature and myofauna abundance. The, um, the reason we don't have a gazillion um, myofauna is because we log, log transform them to make it easier to put on a graph. Um, temperature, even when you got low temperatures, you know, 7, 8 degrees, and you have all the to 27, 28 degrees, not a, not a big difference as far as, um, or not a difference at all as far as myofauna abundance. I mean, you have to go up and down some, but I mean, it's pretty much the same. Temperature, not not a big part. Um, dissolved oxygen, pretty much the same. Um, it, dissolved oxygen, like I said, hung in the um, three to six mil, uh, milligrams per liter range. Uh, so you have a few outliers here and there. You got like one right here, pretty low, right here, pretty high, but still not a, not a big contributor. And same for salinity. That was pretty much a pretty much the salinity hung in the, 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 like the exact same range. Like most of the most of them were between. 36 to 38 um, milligrams per liter. Again, a few outliers, a few you know, weird numbers. Could be sampling error, it could just be the, the, the station itself, but pre pretty much hanging, hung in the same area, didn't have a really big effect on my fauna abundance. We did a, as, um, Dr. Carter did a um, spearman rate correlation to, to see if there's any relationship between fauna with each other. If, if, you, if you found one, did you find the other one? And with their environment as well, and we found that nematodes, nematodes and polychaetes are typically found together. There's a real value of 0.72. Um, nematodes and, poly and copepods are found together, and so were polychaetes and copepods as well. And these these values, like I said, are again are not really surprising because that's what that's what we found most of every sample, every station, every year was polychaetes, copepods, and nematodes. We found some correlation between all the groups except for nematodes with latitude and longitude. Um, nematodes apparently don't care where they are in the Gulf. They're everywhere, all over the place, east, west, central, up, down, forwards, backwards. Um, overall abundances uh, uh, um, were more in the east, which is the eastern section for negative 88 to about negative 83, and a little bit to the south, a little bit under um, 29 degrees latitude. Um, again, those matrices were found everywhere. Didn't matter the depth, didn't matter the location. They were, they, were, they were pretty much everywhere. Um, relationship between sediment um, composition and taxa were found. Um, sand apparently is pretty popular with myofauna. Um, we found our most minor phyla were found in the sandier stations, which were in the east. And then the overall abundances were higher in the east, which also had more sand in them. So, and in the, in the, in the, in the middle to the western stations, the sand, when you, when you moved from the east to the west, we sampled. Our actual sampling, we, we started in the west and went east, but, we, but when you head back the other direction from east to west, you have a dec decline in sand from the eastern station to the central to the, to the western, and you have an increase in clay as you move from the east to the central to the west. And in the, and in the clay, we didn't find a lot of, a, a big difference was not found with clay. Um, dissolved organic material um, didn't have an effect on, on, on any of the organisms. It did on tortoise, pockets, and copepods slightly, but not not done nothing drastic. It was mostly sand that, that had its biggest effect. Um, again, they were uh, the sand was, the, the sandier stations were in the east, and population declined a little bit in the central and in the western part as well. Um, most of them were found in the east. Um, clay was found in the central stations, but that, that's all the stations where we found the, the lesser amounts of myofauna. 
Um, nine groups, again, were found. Um, Um, the Amicos, Pockets, and Couple Pods were always found together. They were found in the sand, in the sandy stations. They were found in the clay stations. They were found in the, in the where it was mixed. It was really it really didn't matter where they were found. And then, in other myofauna studies from all over the world, these were found um, by different people. They were found in the they were found in the Indian Ocean. They were found. There was a study in the Mediterranean. There was another one in the Gulf of Mexico that were found. That these guys typically make up the the bulk of a, of a, of a myofauna survey. Um, I don't have the, I didn't put the locations for each individual one, for each individual study, but these these major tags accounted for 90% of, of the study, 87 of, of here. Like all these studies, they were pretty much dominated by nematodes, copepods, and polychaetes. And also in some other studies, the rare fauna that we found were all there were very similar reports of, 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 of very very similar numbers, but other in other studies. We found, like I said, I think our, our highest percent of, of, my, of minor fauna, minor phyla, was about 1.01 percent, roughly. And in most most other studies, these other people found very very low numbers as well that we, that we did as well. Um, in, uh, in other studies, um, it's an interesting note with our um, increasing depth. We didn't see a big difference, or we didn't see a difference at all in the fauna population. But in other studies, they have they have they have previously reported that. With increasing water depth, you have decreasing abundance due to lack of food and oxygen, and we didn't we didn't find that. Um, in in the Jeff Bagley study from 06, um, they found that malpond abundance in, uh, decreased with increasing depth. But one of the big things was when you look at when you compare like our study to their studies and other studies around the world is that. Our, our deep sampling depth was 500 to 9 meters, and that was only one of those. Most of them, our depths floated in the range between 200 to 300 meters. Um, the Bagley study from 06, the average depth of a sample was 1,800 meters, compared to our average depth of about 200 to 250. So there is a huge difference as far as where they sampled at depth wise and where we sampled at. We sampled on the, on the slope and on the shelf, where they sampled deeper into the Gulf. So their, their average depth. Out, out like outstrips ours. This is just, just, just a huge difference. That, that's our maximum depth, and that's their average depth. So that was definitely a big difference as far as depth was. And I said in the, in the four years we only had one above 500 and 509. So the, we didn't have anything deeper than that. Their depths probably um, a lot for deeper sampling. You probably got a better be, better sampling, and you probably got more of a, a actual view into like how. The benthos are, are, are actually inhabited, by, like what they're inhabited by, in the deeper parts, as opposed to just where we were in the shallow parts. So ours, like I said, not deep enough to really kind of we didn't see we, we didn't see those trends, the, the uh, decreasing abundances with increasing depth develop because we didn't get the sample deep enough. Um, had we sampled a little lower, not so northern, where when you get off the slope and you're into the deeper parts, we, we might have hit some deep some deeper um, sampling stations, but we didn't because we were. We were on the slope and on the shelf, so we didn't actually get to go into the deeper parts like we could have. For sure. um, three major groups were not affected again by, by latitude and space. They were they were in the east, they were in the west, they were in the central parts. Um, but uh, again, latitude we, we felt like that they that it was that it played a larger role in rare fauna dispersion. They were found mostly in the east, few in the central, not a lot. Some in the west, again, not a lot, but mostly mostly in the in the east. This is a chart with one uh, comparing the major taxa to longitude. Um, we, we're here in the western stations, but we we got a lot of major taxa in the central, not a lot in the east. We have a, a ton again nematodes, which is a, the, they were a, they were mostly than anything else. They were here all, all across here. They had more abundances and everything else, but still, the couple pods and plucky still played a, a pretty big role as, as far as the, the major taxa was concerned. And you got minor taxa, which again, not a lot. Few in the west, almost none in the, cent in, none in the central, most of them around in the east. Um, sediment has previously been has, has been shown to influence off on abundances. Um, there's also, I, I, I should have cited a, um, 
a, a Fleeger study that I'm, it's right, it's actually right here. So I did, I did about that. Um, typically, the, the sediment plays a role in what you have or how much you have of it. Um, specifically, for example, with nematodes, they inhabit different types of soil and you have different like physiological changes. Like in clay, in, like in, 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 in clay areas, you have nematodes that will be a little bit fatter and not so long in order to deal with the clay and then in like sandier ones, so they can so they can move the they can move the sediment, they'll be a little bit longer, a little bit thinner, so they can weave in out this in the sand particles. So it depends on where you are, it, it really depends on what you find. So had we actually taken nematodes to species, we might have could have said, well hey, this is these kind are in the sand, these kind are in the clay, but we found crap tons of nematodes. We we probably could have taken some of them out and did find them species and where they were. In terms of the gold, but we did not. It would probably have taken a long time. Oh, but we, we did send off minor attacks of, to, to places, but I don't know where what ever came of them or where they went. I'm not sure if I asked them. But it's not a big deal. Um, soil composition itself was, in, was influenced uh, in the Gulf because in the eastern stations, west of west of 80, oh, excuse me, east of 88 degrees, that we, is where we found most of the sandy samples, and in the middle we found the ones with clay and organic matter. Um, the Bagley study from 06 that I've cited before found that myofauna increased in clay samples that he, that, that he took, but we didn't, we didn't find that. We found more myofauna in sandy samples. Um, it can be attributed to food, um, the location, the time of the sampling. His was published in 06, I think he sampled in 04 and 05. Um, the time difference could, could have made a difference. The, the location of the samples in the Gulf could have made a difference. There's several reasons where why he could have found more myofauna in, in clay samples and, and, and when we found more myofauna in sandy samples. Um, so overall, we, we think that, it, it, that the uh, myofauna abundance seems to be regulated by sediment composition and some location in the Gulf. The, um, the sediment composition itself is influenced by location because I said in the east we found the sand, in the middle we did not, in the west we did not. Um, depth is a play role, but again, we only sample from, from shallow areas. And the average the actual, in the entire depth, the entire gulf itself, the average depth is 1,600 meters. Um, the deepest part of the gulf is 4,000 some odd meters, I think almost five, I think it's like 48 or 40, it's pretty high. Um, and that's about 200 miles off the coast of Texas. It's called Sigsby Deep. It's the, the, that's the deepest part of the actual Gulf. But like I said, our samples range between 200 and 250, and the average depth of the Gulf is 600 meters. But I guess the upside to that is, is if, if, if people are doing studies from shallower areas, they can compare their, their data to our data. Not, not necessarily can you really compare our shallow, you could compare our shallow data from, from studies that had Deeper, deeper depths, but for people that are doing shallower parts, they can definitely compare their study to our study. Um, let's say again, sediment, con sediment content um, is controlled by location. Um, in the sand is where we found the most amount of myofauna. Um, there's several reasons why it could increase, the increase in the, in the clay samples which are in the east and, and declined in the samples that were in the, in the uh, central and western part. Um, you got patchiness, you got geophysical differences of the slope, and, and you got shelf, and you got just all kinds of different physical structures in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico that could have possibly affected what we found and how much of it that we found. And his acknowledgments, uh, Dr. Mano, obviously, um, was pretty crucial in me being a student here. Dr. Jordan, Dr. Charlie Jordan, rather, um, for, for, for helping out, she's pretty awesome. Um, Dr. Carter, awesome. Dr. Klein's awesome. Dr. Abram also helps them. Um, everybody, everybody's pretty much awesome. And um, I think that's uh, about what I got. Is there something concurrent or 
uh, in the Gulf or another thing I was thinking if currents have a lot to do with what the sediments are where just you know moving the sediments I wonder if there's any storms or anything that might have occurred during your study that that you might be able to look back and attribute to why in some cases you were finding more than others I guess it's a bigger question but you said I think you can see where I'm getting that, that's possible and Dr. Tyne also mentioned that um that when the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf, that, that's another that, thing I was thinking too. Is, that, is the larger rivers emptying Mobile as well as Mississippi? Right. They can affect when it empties. Um, I got to look at. He, he told me I'm still going to look to look, look at this and into a um, uh, John Moser's thesis from 2002 that um, it should be in there to where the currents move this way in the Gulf. So when, so, so when the sediment comes out of the, out of the Mississippi River, the lighter, the the, the, the heavier stuff, like the sand particles, when it when it gets moved over here. The current's not strong enough to actually bring it to the west, whereas the, the lighter stuff is like, like some of the nutrients and some, some of the organic matter keeps getting moved, moved over, and, you, and it lands in the central and lands in the western states, and where the sand is too heavy, and it lands in the eastern part. That's that, and then you have the openness from the uh, from from the from, from the actual Atlantic like, Ocean itself could also play a role as well. But the Mississippi River, I think, is definitely a, a big contributing factor. I don't know why I didn't put that. I don't know why I didn't, it's, in, it's in the thesis. I didn't put it in, in my presentation, but it's definitely in the in, in the work. I don't know why I didn't put it on here. Any other questions?